And today, what I'm going to talk about, as I was preparing this message, I want to talk about misunderstandings. How many of us have had a misunderstanding with someone else? I think all of us, right? And misunderstandings, they just can be the worst, right? And they can be very, very costly. It could ruin relationship. It could ruin friendships. It could even start wars. And I'm sure all of us, like I said, um, asked earlier, we've all been misunderstood by someone or we've misunderstand someone else. And when nothing is done about that misunderstanding, oftentimes what breaks down is relationships. That's the result. So what is the key to resolve misunderstandings? I believe it's communication and humility. One party must be willing to communicate and one party must be willing to listen. Basically, someone has to make the effort not to give up on the relationship. So if misunderstanding between one another by ourselves could be very costly, could ruin friendship, relationship, starts war, how about our misunderstanding of God or our misunderstandings with God? See, God is all-knowing. He's all-powerful. Therefore, our understanding with, of Him will be limited and we're bound to misunderstand Him. And I believe that our misunderstanding of God is not he misunderstands us, is that we misunderstand who he is. And I think there are factors of why we have misunderstandings of God. For example, maybe it's our culture. Maybe it's our upbringing or the choices that we've made in our lives or our education. Maybe it's the mistakes that we've made. So it gives us a misunderstanding of who God is, what God is like, and what he wants of us. And the implication of our min- misunderstanding is very costly. Costly to us and costly to God. We're all familiar with John 3:16 that he loves this world so much that he gave his one and only son that whomever so believes shall not perish but have eternal life. See, this is the good news. Where there are misunderstandings, God will always provide further explanation. God won't leave us in the dark of our misunderstanding. That's why Jesus came to earth. The invisible God became flesh among the people that he created to give further explanation, to show the Father's love and how to live out the laws that he gave to his people and, of course, to pay for our sins. See, not only does God provide further explanation, he is relentless in pursuing us relentless in encountering us, and he's going to do whatever it takes to set us free from our misunderstanding. The truth will set us free, and that truth is Jesus. He's been anointed to set the captives free so that we can live in fullness of life as he intended. And I'm going to show you this through the text, John chapter 4. I'm going to, we're going to read a little bit. I'll read it for you, and so we could make more sense of this whole misunderstandings. John chapter 4, we're going to read from the NIV, it's up on the screen, is Jesus talks with the Samaritan woman. So basically, the context is Jesus was baptizing, or his disciples was, and there were some rumors about him and, and, and John the Baptist, and we're going to start with verse 3. So Jesus left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria, so he came down to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. uh, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about noon. Okay, let me show you a little map here. So he was in Judea, and he needed to get to Galilee. The fastest way to go to Judea to Galilee is to go straight. It would take about six, I think it was six, six days. Now, most Jews, they, they don't like the Samaritans. So they do whatever it takes to avoid Samaria altogether. They would go through Peria up to Galilee. So instead of taking six days, they would take a two-weeks journey. So Jesus, so in the context, Jesus just went straight through Samaria. Okay, so let's continue. So he was in Samaria. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus t- said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? 
Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that you ask for a drink, or ask you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would give you the living water. And she was like, What is he talking about, living water? So in her idea, living water was water that's running through. It doesn't stay in one place. So she thought that was living water. So Jesus here is trying to give further explanation. She said, Sir, the woman you said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can we get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from himself and did also his son in livestock? So here we see there is a misunderstanding. Jesus was trying to give further explanation, but she didn't know what he was talking about. So Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So clearly there's a misunderstanding here, right? Jesus was talking about he is the living water and he can give eternal life, but she thought it's actual water. So he says, Go and call your husband and come back. See, oftentimes Jesus approaches us and he's trying to give us a further clarification. Maybe it's theologically and we don't understand. So Jesus takes a different approach with this woman now. And she says, go, call your husband and come back. It's just a weird transition of living water and all of a sudden go and call your husband. She goes, I have no husband, she said. Jesus said to her, you're right. When you say you have no husband, the fact is you had five husbands. The person that you're living with is not even your husband. And I love her answer. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our ancestors worship in this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place of worship is in Jerusalem. What a deflection, right? Jesus is is clearly speaking into her life, her lifestyle, what's going on in her life, and she just deflected it. And instead of dealing with what was going on in her life, she tries to deflect the conversation by having a theological conversation with Jesus. I think I find that very funny. And I think a lot of times that's us, that Jesus approaches us and he encounters us and he reveals something about our lives. He wants to give a further explanation. But instead of dealing what he has revealed to us, we deflect and we talk about something else. The woman, uh, woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritan worship what you don't know, but we worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet there is a coming, and now, <coughs> yet a time is coming, and now that time is here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. They are the kind of worshiper the Father seeks. For God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Let's pray. Father, would you open our hearts? Would you give us further explanation of what we need to learn and experience tonight? In your name we pray. Amen. Out of the passage that we just read, I'm going to point out three, three main points and some mis- common misunderstandings that needs to be further explained or clarified because misunderstandings are costly. The first one, there is a misunderstanding that godly encounters only occurs during church. I'm going to say that again. The misunderstanding is that godly encounters only occurs during church activities or when we come to worship night. In this passage, it's clear that Jesus initiated the encounter with this Samaritan woman. And what was she doing? She wasn't at the temple. She wasn't at the mountain worshiping. She was just going about on her daily task, getting water. Jesus will encounter you. Jesus will encounter me on our everyday task. He will use every opportunity to have an encounter with us in our daily tasks. So what is your daily task? 
be an expectation for Jesus to encounter you there. Most of us, this is not to condemn anyone, but most of us, we only seek the things of God. We only expect an encounter with God when we are at church or at church activities. But most of us here, I believe, are, work, are already working. We spend most of our days where? At work. So if we, Jesus will approach us. He will encounter us in our daily tasks. So why doesn't he wait until we come to church? Why does Jesus want to encounter us during our daily tasks? Well, it's simple. If he waited for us to seek him, he would have waited a very long time, right? Because sometimes we just forget. We have a very proactive God. It shows from this story, right? Hallelujah, we have a proactive God. He always makes the first move. We've all, some of us are married, some of us are dating, some of us want to be dating, and when we remember that, it's like, oh, who's going to make that first move? I know they like me, but then it's like, uh, that's not God. He is always going to make the first move. If you have a misunderstanding of who he is, what his word says in your life, you have a misunderstanding what you're supposed to do with your life, he's the one going to be proactive. He's going to search you out. He's going to make the first move. He always does. So be in expectancies to encounter God in your daily task. Don't only expect to encounter God when we're at church. Yes, we do encounter here, but... Jesus will encounter you in your daily tasks. I love what Rick Warren says. God is more concerned about your character rather than your career because he can make your career just happen. So that's the first misunderstanding. A lot of us, we only expect to hear from God, to receive from God, to experience God, to have godly encounters when we come to church. But when it comes to Monday to Friday or Saturday, Saturday is going out, so there's no God there. Monday to Friday is work, so there's no God there. So we have this misunderstanding. But God will speak to you. God will encounter. God will proactively seek you out in your daily tasks. Secondly, there's a misunderstanding that Jesus only pursues a certain kind of people. Some of us think Jesus will not pursue me. He might pursue the, you know, the people who's up here on stage, the worship leader. He might pursue Matt because he sings so, like, you know, passionately, you know. Good job, Matt. See, God is all-knowing. He knows my thoughts. He knows what I've done in the past. He knows what I'm thinking now. He knows everything about me. Why would he choose me? Some of us think that way. I'm sure Jesus is only pursuing those who are faithful to him, those who love him, those who are like, you know, at church all the time. See, that's another misunderstanding. Jesus pursues everyone. Jesus wants everyone, and he loves everyone. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And that includes you, even you. See, some of us have a hard time believing that, why would God love me? Sometimes I don't believe him. Sometimes I don't have faith. Oftentimes I curse him. When things go bad, I blame him. When things go good, I'm like, oh, it's because of me. But God wants all of us. Let's go back to the passage. The Samaritan woman said, you're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. What? Not even just a Samaritan. I'm a woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jews do not associate with Samaritans. So why, like, let me give you a context. Why do they not like each other? Well, Samaritans are, they're basically half-breeds, half-Gentile, half-Jew. The race came about uh, after the Assyrian captivity of northern kingdom Israel in 1721 BC. So some people from the nation of Israel, they stayed behind and they married with the Assyrians, producing the Samaritans. They're half-breeds. So they believe in the Pentateuch, but their place of worship is at Mount Gerasim, where the Jews believe the place of worship is in Jerusalem. I asked some of the, my friends, like, you know, to give you a little context, I asked, uh, do you understand the Montagues and the Capulets? And most of them says no. Romeo and Juliet. Them two families, we don't know why, but they're just like, Arr. okay. Okay, some of you guys are like, ah. Oh. Don't understand. Okay, how about the Lannisters and the Targaryens? Wow. 
Okay. Anyway, Jews and Samaritans, they just don't like each other. But this proves that Jesus goes for everyone, that not only does he go through Samaria, he talks to a woman. Jewish teachers are not supposed to be around women, especially Samaritan women. Okay? But Jesus being there with her, alone, asking her for a drink, he's risking his reputation, he's risking everything. Some Jews believe that Samaritan women are always unclean because they're always menstruating. So it's just, it's unbelievable how these two, the Jews and the Samaritan, they just don't like each other. So what does that mean for us today? From this story, we see that Jesus loves everyone. He pursues everyone, including you. There's no barrier that he's not going to go through. You might have done something in your past that you've regretted. You might have a reputation that you didn't want. Maybe you were born, you thought you were born in the wrong family at the wrong time, maybe in the wrong race. But Jesus loves you. He's, he wants you. He will pursue you. He will be relentless regardless who you are, what background you're from. That's the misunderstanding that we need to get out because some of us, we just have a hard time believing that God would love us. See, the Samaritan woman had some misunderstanding. Number one, she misunderstood who God truly is. Secondly, she understood misunderstanding what actually can satisfy her in life. She had five husbands and still living with someone who was not her husband. She was looking for satisfaction and fulfillment in the wrong places and the wrong things. And she had a misunderstanding of worship. And Jesus is approaching her to give her further explanation. He's talking about living water. He's talking about eternal life through himself. And he confronts her of her sin. John 4 verse 10 says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked and given you living water. See, the Samaritan woman didn't have the correct understanding, but Jesus wanted to give further explanation further explanation of what this living water is, further explanation of eternal life. And I want to focus on this. She had a misunderstanding about worship. He says, Our ancestors, they worship on this mountain, but you Jews claim that you worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus says, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming. Well, be, it doesn't matter where you worship. It doesn't matter if you worship the Father on this mountain or Jerusalem. Jesus gives further explanation of worship. Worship of the Father is not confined to a place, to a single geographical location. You can worship God anywhere at any time. Amen? And worshiping God is not limited on Sundays or during worship night. We can worship God at all places at any time. Secondly, Jesus says the time is coming. Indeed, it's now that God the Father is looking for a worshiper who worships in the spirit and in truth. What does that mean to worship in spirit and truth? Spirit and truth corresponds to whom we worship and how we worship. It means that the real worship comes from the spirit within and based on our true views of who God is through Jesus Christ. To worship in spirit means that God is spirit. We must know who we're supposed to worship. We must know who we are worshiping, and we're only supposed to worship Him. We're told that we're not supposed to have any other idols. We're not supposed to put anything above God. And as I grow to be a Christian, oftentimes the temptation is not other things. Oftentimes the temptation is putting myself as God. So worshiping in spirit is that we know who we are worshiping. And worshiping in the spirit is opposite of worshiping in mere external ways. It's the opposite of formalism and tradi traditionalism. So the Jews, they worship at the temple and they had all sorts of rules and how they were supposed to worship and how they were supposed to, worship, to approach God. To worship in truth means that worship must be in keeping with the truth of God's revealed word. We must study the word to know who and what God is like. Based on our studies and our understanding of who God is, we worship Him. 
we can study the Word of God. We can know that God is love. We have to have the right knowledge of who God is. Not only do we have the right knowledge, when we have that right knowledge, we can worship Him. But as we come together for events like this as worship night, we experience His love. Somehow as we worship Him, as we declare these things of God, somehow He moves within our hearts and we experience that love, we experience that peace. So to worship in truth is not just the emotions. It's not just the experience, oh, I feel His presence, but we need to study the Word of God. We need to worship Him on base on who He is. So it's not one or the other. So worship in truth, also talking about our truth. This woman, she wasn't having a great life. Jesus was confronting her. You had five husbands. You're not even married to the one that you're living with. We can worship God at any time of our lives. Meaning that we come as we are in truth of who we are. Are we angry at God? Are we disappointed? Are we living in sin as she was? As we confuse? Do we need further explanation? All are welcome by the Father. So this is the kind of worship that the Father is seeking. It's not just about the emotions. It's about the heart and about the head. Because if we have the wrong understanding of who God is, then we're worshiping a false idol. So we need to study the Word of God. I'm so excited. Some of our friends, they're you know, studying apologetics and they're going deeper into the Word. So worship, it's about the head and it's also about the heart. We must study the Word of God so we know who we are worshiping. Can I invite the team to come back up? And I said earlier that worship is a matter of the heart. We worship Him because He is worthy of our praise. Psalms 105 says, For the Lord is good, His unfailing love continues forever, and His faithfulness continues each generation. So worship in spirit and truth means we know who we worship and we worship the truth of God according to His Word. So those are the misunderstanding. Number one, we misunderstand thinking that godly encounters only happen at church. In reality, Jesus wants to approach you on your daily tasks. Misunderstanding number two, can Jesus possibly love me? He loves everyone. One of our family values here is we don't care where you've been. We don't care your past. We only care about where you're going. Why? Because Jesus receives us just as we are. Misunderstanding number three, it's about worship. What does it mean to worship in spirit and truth? Some of us believe that worship, oh, it's just when I'm here, I'm worshiping God and I experience Him. That's true worship. We must get into the Word. We must study our God. We must know the Word of God. And lastly, what is your truth? The woman was living with a person that wasn't even her husband, right? God confronted her gently. So when you came in, all of you had this piece of paper here. I want you guys to take the time to reflect and to respond that we can come to Jesus just as we are in our truth we might not be like that woman but all of us fall short of God's glory this is something that Pastor Oyan had put together during our break fasting but it's a great tool that oftentimes we come we sing our songs and we hear but we don't get to sit and spend time with the Lord I'm gonna give you guys five minutes up on the clock and if we need to spend a little bit time we could does everybody have one yes does anybody need one in the front here so what I would like you to do spend five minutes go through this prayer spend time with the Lord just to reflect upon it and then we'll continue our worship
Lord Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that you will always give further explanation, that you will always receive us just as we are, and that we could always come and worship you just as we are. And Lord, thank you that your kindness will lead us to our repentance. Father, I pray that perhaps some of us here needs further clarification, further explanation, either of your word or the direction of our lives. And we know, Lord, by being here, by worshiping you, by declaring these things about who you are, Father, that somehow that you would speak to us and through the songs that we're singing. And Lord, for those of us who never thought that you would pursue us because of what we've done in the past, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would just overfill us with your love, that we would leave this place knowing that you are for us and not against us, and regardless what we've done in the past, that you will still, still receive us and that love us, Lord. And I pray, Father God, in these coming weeks, in our daily tasks, that we'll have encounters with you. And I pray, Father God, that we would have that you would give us the courage that when you do encounter us that you reveal the things that are going on in our lives just how she can conf jesus confronted this woman when you confront us i pray that we will not deflect but we would humbly come before you and ask for forgiveness and humbly come before you and thank you that you are gently bringing us back your plan to the way we're supposed to live our lives so we thank you lord that you are a proactive god that you will never grow tired of us misunderstanding you or your word that you will always give further explanation and we thank you that the truth will set us free so that we can live the fullness of life as you intended so lord it's all about you jesus